in many different branches of the Army. <laughs> Can you give us your rank and where you served? Well, uh, I was a PFC and I was, I don't know, France mostly, okay. until I got captured. And then? Then I was in Salak 12A Luchenwald, Germany, and we volunteered to work, which we were advised to do. So we, we were, a few of us were sent to a little town by the name of Wundsdorf, where we worked and we all fought for the job to shovel the horse manure. It was a very wealthy lady who had who was married to a big deal German officer, so she was the only one in the area with horses. But we used to fight for that job because it was nice to stand in the warm manure. Everything else was at below zero at all times. But the main thing we did was cut the wood that they burned in their vehicles for fuel. Okay. Can uh -huh. we hold that thought for a minute and we'll, we'll get some background history first? Oh, sure. If that's okay? Yeah. All right. Let's just think for a minute when you started the service and kind of walk back through the whole process. All the so, way through the service? Well, <laughs> when you were drafted, basically. Yeah. Um, where were you living at the time? In Newtown. In Newtown, Connecticut? I was looking up on Main Street next door to the monument up there. Okay. That was my grandparents' home. Why did you join the service at that time? I didn't join. I was drafted. Drafted. Okay. Um, you were drafted into the Army then? Yes. Did you have any choice? Uh, no. Previously, my friend and I had tried to enlist in the Marines, but they wouldn't take me because my left leg was an inch shorter than my right. So they said. I don't believe it, but that's what they said. So we, di we didn't go in the Marines. Probably lucky at that. Your friend's name? Henry Krohn. K-R-O-H-N. And do you recall the first days of service when you joined? Would have been boot camp. Yeah. The, the long train ride from the camp in Massachusetts to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And uh, both he and I spent our 13 weeks there and both came out as gunner corporals on 105 Howitzer that meant you were in charge of a six-man crew. And uh, but at that time, the government, the Army started the ASTP program. Are you familiar with that? No, you have to spell that out. Army right. Specialized Training Program. They took over a whole, I don't know, I should say several universities throughout the country, and they were going to make us engi engineers in two years. We went to classes 12 hours a day, six days a week. And uh, everything went great through the first semester. We both passed with flying colors. And halfway through the second semester, they closed the whole program down. That's that. No waste there, is there? No. I mean, I don't know how many universities were, were involved, but there were many. North Carolina, Ohio, and several to the west, and I, I don't know how many. Do you remember any of your instructors? From, from that period of time? No, I guess I don't. I, mean, I have no records of it either. Okay. Um, did you have anything special that you did to get through those experiences to start with? No, I don't know anything special. Uh, we were, at that, at the university, we were confined to the, the grounds. We were not allowed to leave the grounds. Okay. And uh, like I said, we had uh, six full days of classes, and Sunday was supposed to be for studying. And then after that closed up, we, we were both eligible for the Army Air Corps. Not the Air, the United States Air Force, then it was the Army Air Corps, yeah. And uh, we both went to. Miami Beach, that was the next stop. We had uh, four weeks of tests. We had tests 8 to 12 every morning, five days a week, and the rest of the time was 
and we both passed all those tests, with, I think were these, and uh, then we all got a letter from General Arnold that our services were no longer required in the Air Corps. <laughs> so then they sent me to Fort Rucker, Alabama, to become an instructor on a 50 caliber machine gun. You see, up to this point, I had never even seen a 50 caliber machine gun. But now i got to instruct these people all about it. <laughs> so they gave me a cadre room and a pamphlet on a 50 caliber, and it was quite simple, so that was easy. After four weeks of that, I'm back in the Air Corps again. They sent me to Stuttgart Air Force Base, Stuttgart, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I spent four or five weeks there doing absolutely nothing. Used to ride around with the pilots in training because they, you know, there's nothing else to do. And uh, after the four weeks there, they, uh, we all got a letter from General Arnold that our services were more needed in the ground forces. As of then, I was in the infantry. Something different for a change. Okay. And then we had, uh, I think it was eight weeks of advanced infantry training. They had basic, but I'm having advanced. This is how the Army operates, you know, in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And after that, they gave us seven days leave, and the next thing was get on the ship and head for Europe. Where did you go at that point? Well, we landed in Scotland, took a train into, into England, and we spent, I don't know, three or four weeks in England. And then? Bef before we got the, the ship to France. Okay. What was your job assignment at that point? Your MOS? I don't know. It was, it was just a, one of the guys, we were infantrymen. Okay. With which unit? What was that? With which unit? I was in the 106th Division. Okay. Thank you. I was in Canada Company, 106th Division, but I never. It's, that's supposed to be howitzers, but I never saw one. Do you remember arriving um, in Europe and, and what it was like, or in France even? How did you get to France? Oh, we took a boat across the okay. channel there. And uh, we were, I don't know, four or five weeks doing what they call mopping up, because the main force goes through and leaves pockets of mm -hmm. resistance. And this is, it was pretty simple. I mean, here we are, a whole, a whole company after these little pockets of resistance. So that was like shooting fish in a barrel, you know. <laughs> we, uh, we cleaned up a few of them and then we got stationed at the, well, we were, where we were stationed after that, we were looking right at the Siegfried line and we could see the Germans up there wandering around. But we were told not to shoot them. Can you describe a typical day for me while you were there? At the it, at the liner, mm -hmm. and, well, yes. Uh, trying to keep warm was the biggest job because it was around twenty below most of the time, and we live in outdoors. And, but I guess we we managed fairly well doing that because we were able to move around and. Uh, but on the. The morning of, we took turns. Naturally, there was six of us in the outpost, so you had two hours on, four hours off, two hours on, four hours off, on watch. And uh, on the morning of the sixteenth, we were on the four to six. My friend Duffy and I were on the four to six uh, watch, and uh, everything was quiet for quite a while. All of a sudden, we could hear. Germans talking, many of them talking, and uh, all of a sudden, somewhere around 5:15, 5:20, the light came up just enough so that they were outlined. And here's here they are, because it's 20 below zero. They're standing as tight together as they can be in a bunch. And so I only had 20 rounds for the 50 caliber, but I cut the, the center right out of the bunch because the 50 caliber doesn't stop at one body; it can, can keep on going. You know? And uh, I know I killed 22 that time because they made me, I was the only one able, they made me move the bodies and line them up alongside the little dirt road they had there. 
So I did 22 of them. I don't know. It's probably some of the other ones died, but I don't have any way of knowing that. Who made you line the bodies up? The German officer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The German officer thing. I was the only one at the time that was able, so I had to do it. Okay. My friend was much more severely wounded than I was. I just had a, a bullet in here, which went through the, the guy that was standing right there to my right. He slowed it down for me, so it only just penetrated my skin here. Okay. And my left hand was all cut up from a, their stupid hand grenades. Our hand grenades are made to kill people. Theirs are made to cut you up. That's all. It's, it's like a tin can mm -hmm. with an explosive in it, and the metal flies in all directions and cuts people. The, what was it like when you were under fire that day? Do you remember? Under fire? Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it was very hot and confusing. I guess you could say, even though it was twenty below, it was it was hectic. Okay. Um, were there many casualties to your unit? Well, there were six of us in the outpost, and, and two of us are, were left alive at that point, because they got four got killed immediately. Do you remember their names? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I know where you learn not knowing. Can you give me a couple, or tell me a couple memorable moments that you think of when you think of that? Well, probably the most memorable was in the cattle car after we were captured. The, their, their train system was pretty messed up, as you can imagine, with, with the, our planes bombing them all the time. And uh, so we, the train moved a little bit and stopped, and moved a little bit and stopped. We were in a cattle car with the open sides, you know, the, mm. and the temperature was very, very cold. So uh, my legs got froze to my solid to my knees, but we called the guys in their 30s at that point, the old men. And like many of them died by standing in the train. They didn't even have room to fall down. They standing up dead. It was, I guess, ten years makes a difference. Things, or ten or fifteen. Some of them fifteen. You know, mm -hmm. must make a difference because they didn't fare very well. Where did the men from the cattle car come from? Well, it, they had captured okay. many others besides us because. You know, the Bulger was a big, right. a big operation, and they they had, and they, they gathered us all up and put us in one of them. Did you talk to any of the men? Oh yeah, at that point? sure. What was the feeling at that point? Do you remember? Well, some of them thought we were going to get killed anyway, hmm. and I don't know. It was wasn't pleasant conversation. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned that you were a prisoner of war. Yeah. Can you tell me about some of the experiences you had being a prisoner? And then some of the experiences or feelings that you had when you were freed? Well, we were very cold all the time. And of course, food we didn't have. Uh, once in a while they would give you what they call a half a liter of grass soup. They actually made soup out of grass because they had nothing else. They didn't have any meat either, you know. And uh, once in a great while on the, in the morning you could have a cup of ersatz coffee, uh, which is the worst tasting stuff you could imagine. <laughs> and the soup was no good either, but I ate or drank whatever I got because I needed something. And uh, even even a drink of water was very scarce. Once in a while we could get near some water, we could have a drink of that. But so basically, there wasn't much going in here. <laughs> That's how come I lost 42 pounds in five months. And I was not fat at the beginning. I was probably in the best possible shape of when I was captured. Okay. So the, the 42 pounds was not blubber. Um, can you describe the rooms that you were kept in? Your facilities and accommodations? Barn. Just an open barn. Mm -hmm. There was not, nothing in it. They had some, some of us had some cots to lay on okay. in the barn. How many were kept in, in a room or a unit? When we were in Stalag 12A, that's where we first went. Mm -hmm. We were there a couple of days and uh, it was, it's just a big barn and you were 
it's open space, nothing nothing in there. But a big enclosed, just a big barn. Okay. Dirt floor. How high? It was very high. I don't know, 12, 14 feet probably. Okay. I don't know what the building could have been for because it was just op an open, nothing in it. Hmm. I pulled a couple images and I don't know if... I don't know if they mean anything to you or... Would that be like the barn? Yes, that's very okay. much like it, yes. I think the last two days before we were liberated was the two days that I lay down the floor and they thought all the guys said that I was dead. Hmm. I would for full 48 hours. I just I guess I never moved or anything because I, I had severe case of yellow jaundice and I was told that's caused by them fertilizing everything they do with their own manure, human manure. Hmm. That's that's caused the yellow jaundice. I was told. Hmm. Now you mentioned that you were asked to go cut wood. Can you talk about that a little bit about that uh, specific task? That yes, you they had? took uh, they took a few of us, maybe five or six of us, into the woods and gave us axes and saws, and we cut the wood that, and, and put it out, piled it on a truck, mm -hmm. and they they took it away and cut it up and, took, and did whatever. But we uh, these trucks ran on wood for fuel, and that. It worked, but they don't have any power whatsoever. We would all have to get all the people they could find get together to push the truck by hand to get it moving, and then they could go. It wouldn't. It wouldn't start up. In other words, on the okay. on the fuel from the wood. Did they? Did you have to walk out to the woods, or did you? Oh yeah. Get transported. Or? We didn't have any ride anywhere. You walked okay. every every. All was walking. Did you have your boots still, or wooden clogs, or shoes, or? I still had my combat boots from okay. the camp. So you still have shoes. They took my watch, but they didn't take them. Okay. <laughs> and, and here's a picture of somebody bringing soup in, but I don't know if that... Huh. That's a different place, I guess, huh? Well, it all popped up under Stalag 12. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. I don't recognize that at all. That's like a whole group of buildings, right? Mm-hmm. This was supposed to be the entrance? Yeah. So I don't remember that either, but it must be. Okay. With POW on the tops of the roofs. Do you remember that? What's that? With POW on the top of a roof. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's so the, they don't bomb it, supposedly. While you were there, were there ever any bombs that, or air attacks, air raids that came over? Oh, yes. Uh, and do, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, they, uh, well, I don't know how important that is, but that's when the P-38 was fairly new. That was our, that was the best fighter plane in the world at the time. And they converted some of them to bombers. Okay. And many of the pilots died because there was no provisions made for when they went into the dive to get out of the dive. Mm. And so many of them P-38s went right into the ground, and after a while they put brakes on them so they could do that. But that's what was, I guess, from up there, they don't know who's down there. So they were, at times, bombing us. I suppose they knew, thought there was Germans too, you know. How did it feel when you heard the, the planes coming in? Do you remember? Well, yeah, in a way we were happy because we, they're blowing up Germans, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, as long as we could manage to get out of the way. My overcoat's out in Sylvania, Ohio. It was, that's where my buddy lived. And uh, it's got a big hole in the back from one of them bombs. I, <laughs> I guess I was running so fast that it must have been hanging straight back. <laughs> it's hard to outrun them bombs, though. <laughs> that's true. What did you have to wear at that time? Uh, well, you see, when we were first captured, they took our overcoats because they needed them. Okay. But later on, I guess sometime late March or around there, they gave us back overcoats. I don't know if it was the same one or anything, but they gave us overcoats. So we had overcoats for the springtime. Hmm. 
And your regular uniform? Yeah, we kept what we had on. We had okay. our fatigues, you know. That's were they wool or the cotton? The, the Was that? Wool, they were the wool ones? Cotton ones, yeah. Cotton ones, yeah. okay. So it was but cold. Don't, don't work good 20 below. <laughs> what did you do to stay warm at that time? Do you remember? Uh, nothing. There was nothing you could do. We couldn't have fires or, you know, okay. nothing like that. Just, you just put up with it. That's all you could do. Do you remember anybody passing away while in in the barn while you were there? Oh yes, Losing several of them, sure. Okay. What was the normal procedure? Do you remember? Uh, I don't know. They just sent a couple of Germans. They took the bodies somewhere. Okay. So the Germans came in and cleaned everybody. Yeah. Um, how many were in the barns? How many were in your barn? Gee, I don't know. Quite a, quite a few. They collected them from a lot of different places and put them in there. Anybody from different countries, or were they all Americans? No, they, they kept them segregated is to that. We, like, uh, at that compound in, in South Lock 12A, I didn't stay there long, but we were next to Italians. Okay. And other nationalities are, were scattered around in, in separate compounds. Then where did you go? Did you go to another location after that? No, the, we were brought back from Woundsdorf to Stalag 12A just about May 4th or 5th. Okay. We, were th we were there a couple of days when the Russians liberated us. Okay. Talk about a crazy bunch. Why? Tell me about that. The Russians? Yeah. Oh, they're wild. They, they all got a canteen of uh, vodka on their side. And the worst part is they thought we ought to drink some. And boy, that's the last thing we needed was vodka. And the, the tank drivers, uh, there were a couple of tanks there, and they, they were driven by girls. And I was impressed by the size of the girls. They're all bigger than me. Mm. And uh, they insisted we drink their stupid vodka, but th they were being nice to us, so they kissed my hand and slapped me beside the face and almost knocked me down. They, you know, they were very... Rough, rough and rugged. <laughs> and then we and then we had to escape from the Russians because, as they said over there, Uncle Sap was paying the Russians a hundred dollars head for liberating us. How and did you escape? We just ran away, and uh, they shot over heads, but we just hoped they wouldn't shoot us. They did because. We got along good with them, you know, everything was happy, but, and I know they were trying to scare us, they were just shooting up over our heads, so trying to scare us, but we kept on running, had crossed the little river, and finally we got to ask somebody, and we found a place where they shuttled them with the old C-47s from there to Camp Lucky Strike, that was in western France. Mm -hmm. How long did that take? Oh, I don't know. We were there ten or twelve days, and before you went to Camp Lucky Strike. Oh no, that that only took a couple of days to, okay. from the time we, the Russians liberated us till we got to the old uh, plane. Bullet holes and everything, all bent up, and you wouldn't think it would fit to be on the road or air or anything, but it got us there. Okay. Did do you know where that was when you left um, for Camp Lucky Strike? Where were you? In Germany, do you remember the place, the name of the place? Well, it, it was not too far from Stalag. We were not far. Uh, I don't know. It, it's so hectic, and uh, they don't have signs or anything over there, right. so we don't know where we were. Okay, so we don't know where you were at that point. Um, it's not on any of those maps that you recognize anything. What's that? It's not on any of the maps that you recognize anything. No. What was your most memorable experience while you were a prisoner of war? Positive. Let's do that first. Well, one thing that always stood out in my mind is when we got taken from 
12 a in looking well it, it, we volunteered to work like I told you they took us to this little town by the name of wound store and th this was just a little camp small I don't think there was over 20 people there and uh, they had a, a big outhouse, and the first thing the Germans did is shoot a couple of the guys and set them up in the outhouse. So I guess that's to show you what happens. They, they said that they tried. They told us they tried to escape, but hmm. of course we didn't believe that. But I think that's a scare tactic. That was that was always. I always remembered that because I guess we figured we were lucky that we weren't the ones that got used for an example in the outhouse. Hmm. We didn't eat not house anyway. He didn't eat or drink anything, so what? You know. <laughs> How about um, any negative experiences that stand out in your mind that you're comfortable talking about? No, no. Consider all negative. Or <laughs> I don't know if any. Which part of it was more negative than the other? Mm. Is there one real memorable moment that you think of? You mean while I was a POW? Mm -hmm. Well, the two guys in the outhouse are probably the most memorable. Okay. That, that was very impressive. And you mentioned being able to stand in the manure as a positive thing. Oh yeah, because it was warm. <laughs> it was warm. Did when you went after you were standing in the manure and shoveling manure and you went back to your barn. Yeah. Did everybody give you a hard time about smelling like a pile of manure or <laughs> No, because many others did too, you know. Okay. They all they all had their turns, most of them. How uh, often did you get to do that? Uh, uh, probably about once a week. Okay. Well, the rest of the time we're cutting wood. And they would take five or six of you out to cut wood? Oh, yes. And then two would go to do manure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When the food came, where did it come from when you got food at camp? In the POW camp? Uh-huh. Yeah, well, uh, it was just a guy come with with a handful of cups and a, and a bucket full of soup. An American or a German or oh German yeah. A German okay. yeah and they would dish out a little bit and and it was gone before you realized you had anything yeah <laughs> did you ever get bread or anything like that no All right. let me ask you a question we, we, uh, excuse me I'm we sorry. did we did once we got a Red Cross package and okay. two and two packs of cigarettes came in there and okay. you could swap a pack of cigarettes with a German guard. For a loaf of bread, so okay. we did that because we needed bread a lot more than cigarettes. <laughs> Was it good bread or terrible bread? Mediocre. <laughs> okay. um, do you remember getting the Red Cross packages? Just get we got one, yeah. How did they come into the camp and and who brought them and what was the reaction? Oh, German German guys brought them. Okay. Yeah, had a little little cart. Do you have any idea how they got them? No, I don't know. The, the Red Cross got stuff through, and uh, American officers in the POW camp got a Red Cross package every week. Hmm. Well, we got one all the time we were there. Very interesting. When you were in. Um, the POW camp. I noticed that there are a couple of postcards in here yeah. that you that you have sent from. Me. Tell me about being able. Were you able to send them on a regular basis, or how did you stay in touch with your family? We very seldom had. I, I don't know whether I sent one or two home. Uh, I guess I sent two by the looks of this, huh? Yeah. She saved them both. My mother did. Okay. Did they tell you what to write, or were you allowed to write anything you wanted to? Oh no, you had to be very careful. You could tell them that you were alive and okay, and 
not really much else. You, know, okay. you couldn't tell them anything about where you were. Tell me about this. This German piece. It of was on. A, it was on a German officer's uniform, and I ripped it off because he didn't need. He was dead. Okay. And I, fortunately, I was able to keep it in my pocket, and nobody got it away from me. Hmm. Actually, I got that before I was captured. But you know, dead people were very numerous at that around then. Yeah. Did you have a lot of supplies while you were there, or just the very basics? You mean before we were captured? Well, yeah. but let's do before you were captured and after you were captured. Well, we were in this outpost, looking at the Siegfried Line for about five days, and. That time, the first four or five days were very quiet until the boat started. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main thing we did was holler on the radio that we needed ammunition. And we did that several times every day, but it didn't work. Okay. We, we each had the one clip for our, our carbine rifle, and we had the 20 rounds for the 50 caliber, and we could never get any more. And I know I shouldn't say it, and people just say I shouldn't say it, but I think it was set up that way. They didn't want us to stop the Germans there. They wanted to get the Germans out into France because there they could take better care of them. They had, they were, it would have been a lot easier to do away with the Germans if they got out into France, mm -hmm. and that's that was the goal, I'm sure. Okay. Um, how about supplies you didn't have when you were POW? No, we didn't have any supplies at all. Once in a while, with, like I said, once in a while you get a slice of the rotten bread or a little can of, can of soup. That was it. Hmm. Feelings of pressure and stress. Do you remember what your feelings were about being stressed? And, and what were the biggest stressors? Well, I, think, I guess there wasn't any except just trying to find something to eat and stay alive. Yeah, okay. That was it. And then when we got to Camp Lucky Strike, we made up for that because I just stayed in the chow line all day. Except for the time I had to take a shower, I was in the chow line. We'll get to Lucky Strike in a minute. Let me just ask you a couple more questions. You mentioned that you had taken this off of a German officer. Yeah. Was that your good luck memento, or did you have a good luck memento that you kept with you? Not really, unless that was it. I don't know. I just put that in my pocket and kept it. What made you take that particular piece? Novelty, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, it was a German officer that had been shot, or yeah. a German enlisted man? No, it was a German officer, but he was very dead. Okay. Um, and that was at the Siegfried Line? Yeah. When people sometimes are stressed and under a great deal of uh, tension, they do crazy things to relieve stress uh -huh. and to entertain themselves. Did you have any entertainers that came through a POW camp, I doubt, but any entertainment that went on in the camp? No, not really. It was very quiet. Very quiet? Okay. Did you ever see any entertainers while you were still overseas? No. I got to speak to General Lagan. Tell me about that. After a few days at Camp Lucky Strike, he came. It was supposed to be a morale booster, mm -hmm. and uh, I he happened to I happened to be able to get right next to him, and uh, I said to him, "When the hell are we going home?" And he said, "Keep bitching, and you'll get there." <laughs> and you did. Yeah, I just kept bitching, and I got there. <laughs> well, that's, that worked then. Um, when did you ever go on leave any at any point while you were in the military? or when you were overseas? Yes, uh, we had seven day leave before we left for overseas. Okay. And seven days at home then. That was it. That was it. Um, can you remember any crazy, I know in a serious situation that sounds not too logical, any crazy pranks or humorous events that ever happened? And gallows humor counts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, well, my good friend and I up there we went to town. We were in North Carolina and had too much to drink, and we were singing on the radio Christmas carols. And that was about as crazy as you could get. <laughs> so that was stateside, though. Yeah. That was stateside. Yeah. Um, obviously, you have some photographs and things that we're going to put in the record, so that's good. Are there any photographs that you'd like to tell me about? Or tell me about this, this record, the German war record. It's a, there's a copy of this at the Military Museum in Danbury. Okay. Uh, How did you get it? What did it mean to you? When we were in, in Camp Lucky Strike, uh, uh, a guy came around with a few in his hand. I don't know, maybe he had 15 or 20. But that's all that was left because they, most of them got destroyed, of course, with the bombing and all that. And uh, he was just hollering out names and all of a sudden I heard my name, so he gave it to me. Hmm. That's what he was doing, trying to find, trying to find the rightful owner. Okay, and these are the POW records. Yeah, very, very detailed, aren't they? Yep. <laughs> all the all the spaces are blank. <laughs> but it does have your thumbprint. Yep. So what did they do? How did they get the thumbprint on there? I mean, what was the procedure when you got to camp? When you became a POW, you came well, out they of just the camp. Get, came out of the get, camp. Get in line and and they. Did that and you kept running. It only took a minute or two and you're gone. Just get in line and do it. Did they take name, rank, and serial number at that point? Well, yes, they did. They took your name, but they, they didn't have to take your rank because they could look at right. you and tell you, know. What did it mean to you to have that in your hand? This? Yeah. Oh, I was glad to get it, yes. Because they were rare. Do you know where he got it from? Not exactly, but he said there was, there was a bunch of them scattered around by a camp that he had been near. Well, it was a POW camp, and he just grabbed what he could and left. Hmm. Strange that you had to end up with that. Yeah. They this the fact that it says I'm a farmer on here that. You know, I was never a farmer, but that's what they told us to say, because you'd be better off if you're, they could let you work on stuff. You know? Who told you that? Do you remember? No, one of the officers before before we went overseas even told us that. That if you were ever captured, you should say you're a farmer? Yeah, yeah you should say you're a farmer. What did they not want you to say? That basically, that you knew anything. Okay. <laughs> If you know anything, you don't tell them. Okay. Because <laughs> they try to get you to do something important if, hmm. if they thought you knew how to do it. So just manual labor was the, yeah. the best. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you ever keep a personal diary while you were there? Probably no. not. What did you write with? Did they give you pencils to write with? Or did you, what did you write with? You know, we borrowed it. I don't know. I don't remember how I got it. Borrowed it. I know I borrowed it. Okay. To write these cards, yeah. And they gave you the cards to write on. Yes. Yeah. What did they do? Come in with a stack of them and say you should write to your family? Yes. They said we should. Yeah. Okay. And they passed out the cards one at a time. You know, at different times, of course. Mm -hmm. And then they collected them? Yep. And what Do you remember what your parents' thoughts were when they got the card? No, I guess not, huh? Do you, know, do you remember anything about that? Nothing to talk. Oh. No, I don't remember anything about that. Hmm. When you left the POW camp and you went to the location just a short distance and then caught the transport to Camp Lucky Strike. Uh -huh. Explain to me what Camp Lucky Strike was like when you got there. Well, it was a very happy place. Those are two images I have. Does that make any yes. sense? Yep. The big tent was 
the mess hall. Okay. And uh, we stood in line to get there most of the time. What did they serve you to eat? Were they careful? Well, they had a variety. They, they had hash and eggs and potatoes. and we, we didn't care what it was. It was good uh, <laughs> after yeah. not eating so long. We, we enjoyed it. Were they very careful of the the very thin POWs, the emaciated ones? Yes, we were told that we were not supposed to get back. If you have a meal, you're supposed to wait till the next meal is served before. But, but my friend and I just kept getting back in line continuously. Food is food. <laughs> we were hungry. And you had no problems ingesting a bunch of food? I didn't know. I know many of them did. Okay. She, like she always said, I got a cast on her stomach anyway. <laughs> and you stayed there how long? At Lucky Strike? Uh huh. Uh, seven days. Seven days. And then where did you go? Well, they they put us on the train and took us to the, the port, and we got on the ship and came home on a Navy transport. Boy, that was good. Luca and Lucy. What the hell was the name of the one we went overseas on? Aquitania. Okay. Uh, we were crowded in there so you could hardly breathe. There were so many people on it. The Aquitania going overseas and it took a little over seven days because, and they had to zigzag because of the submarines. Mm -hmm. And every time they did that, most of the guys went, yeah. and we got on there and I drew a bottom bump and they were, seven high in an eight foot ceiling, so the, if you got in the bunk, you stayed that in that position, there was no room to move. But I was unfortunate enough to draw a bottom bunk, and all them guys up there are throwing up. Mm -hmm. my so I laid down for a little while the first night, and then I never laid down again. Couldn't. I just sat in the corner. It's safer. Did the, I'm curious, um, knowing that the submarines are out there and you were zigzagging, did they give you any um, instructions on what to do if the ship was hit? No. no. no they, they, I guess they thought we must know enough for that. <laughs> I don't okay. know. They didn't, they didn't say anything about it. All right. And then coming back, do you remember the name of the transport again was? I don't remember the name of the transport. It was, in, it was a Navy transport ship. Okay. And the nice part about that was it just only took four days going over to take seven mm -hmm. and a half. Why was that, do you think? Which, they're going over? Coming back, or coming home. Well, they had a much faster ship and they went in a straight line. Okay. And at that point, the Aquitania was quite, quite old, you know, and by, t by those standards, it was kind of slow and low. Mm. Where did you come into? We landed in Scotland. So you went going over? from Camp Lucky Strike to... Oh, no, we came right into New York. Okay. Yeah. And then you were released from service, or what happened when you got to New York? Uh, we were assigned to... I was assigned to Fort Meade, Maryland. So we got the train to Fort Meade. Okay. And the first thing they did is give me a... Was it 30 days? 30 day furlough. What did you do then? Drank beer. <laughs> <laughs> that was the main occupation. <laughs> did you go back to work then? Everybody? Well, you went back to the military then? After 30 days? After 30 days, I went back to Fort Meade, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And they made me the assistant to the mail department. And this is, it was a replacement depot, so the mail clerk has nothing to do. Once a week he has to go around to the barracks and put change of address cards in the container in each barracks. And if, if, he, weren't, if, he, if he was in a hurry, he could do that in about two hours. That, that's the whole week's work. So, and I was his assistant. Once or twice, I guess twice, he wanted to take off, so... I did this card job. Otherwise, my weekend started sometimes Thursday night and ended Tuesday morning. <laughs> I, I used to come home. We were going together. Then. I was 
I just had them nice weekends. Mm -hmm. And in between, he he had a car, and he used to taxi guys from Port Mead to Baltimore. Baltimore was the big thing then. Uh, now you say he. Who is he? And when he was gone. Who was he? What's that? Who is he? The, the, the mail clerk? Mail clerk. I, I, unfortunately, I don't remember his name. Okay. Thank you. When he was gone? When, when he was doing something else, I used to drive his taxi for him back and forth to Maryland, make a couple of bucks, you know. <laughs> it was, uh, there was nobody on the road, and this was a four-lane highway, not divided, but four-lane highway. Hmm. And so you got started, and you put the pedal to the metal, and then you stopped when you got there. That's, there, was, there was no traffic. <laughs> it was amazing. Hmm. After being at Fort Meade, then what happened? Uh, I stayed there till discharge. And you were discharged? I don't remember the date. I don't know if it's on this mess or not. I, I sorry, I don't. Uh, well, about a month or so afterwards, or two months, or. Yeah, about, about six weeks after I okay. got home, I was discharged. <clears throat> but in the meantime, I. Uh, they sent me to, uh, I'll think of it in a while, New York State, uh, Lake Placid. And uh, that's where they yanked the rest of my teeth out and supposedly fixed up any medical problems. Did you, you mention that you got shot in the buttocks area? Yeah. Did you have any residual problems with that? No. It healed by itself. But see, the guy next to me slowed it down, so it just did penetrate the skin. Okay. And it was not a problem. All right. Um, how about your feet from the cold, or your hands from the cold? Uh, my hands were okay, but my in that train, mm -hmm. my legs actually got further as to my knees. And they're, they still feel the after effects of that. Okay. It's uh, actually the after effects of that. It may, it's it's harder for me to sit still than it is to walk. Hmm. You had mentioned a couple friendships that you had, Duffy for one. Yeah. Um, did you stay in touch with him? Oh, Obviously, yes. he's deceased now. But oh yes, he's been deceased many years now. Did you stay in touch with any of the other men that you served with? No, because I wasn't close to any of them like I was him. He and I were together for a long time in this country before we even went overseas. And then he was also a POW? Yes. Okay. But see, he wouldn't eat the garbage they gave us. And that, you know, the after effects of not eating is what really got him. Hmm. Tell me about He lived that. to be 66, I think. Okay. But his health was not good most of that time. What did he survive on then? Uh, I don't know. He was pretty He was pretty chunky when we went over, but boy, he got skinny in a hurry. Hmm. Um, have you joined any veterans organizations? Oh, yeah. Here in the United States, yeah. and if so, which ones? At uh, this DAV, Disabled American Vet, mm -hmm. I, I bought, and that's the first one I joined. And then I joined the XPOWs. And several years after that, I joined the DAV. No, I'm sorry, the VFW. Okay. Get my letters mixed up. Yeah. Have you been an officer in any or done anything, um, you know, organizational-wise in any no, of those organizations? No. Just a member? I just, uh, when I first got home, I went to, attended all the DAV meetings with with what was our first son-in-law <laughs> and our <laughs> neighbor. <laughs> 
and three of us used to go to the meetings together. Okay. And then they they petered off, so petered out, so so did I. And uh, I have never been to XPOW meetings because they're way up in the northern corner of the state. Mm. And but I have been to the VFW because they're right here in town. Okay. And it's a good place to get beer. <laughs> Huh? Fireman, yeah, fireman. Oh yeah, I was a volunteer fireman. Still, I'm a still am a senior. I'm a senior member at the volunteer fire department. But I, I uh, joined them in 1956. Okay. What did you do after the war? Well, I guess. Other than drink beer for 30 days. I went to trade school. Okay, tell me about a, that. To become a carpenter. All right. I, I did. I worked days and did that nights. Went to school. And did you become a carpenter then? Oh yes. Here yeah. in the new town. And then I I, uh, I worked for a few years for another contractor, and then I had a partner, and we went in business, and we did that for many years. Okay. We built many houses, and we built a couple of firehouses. Have you ever seen the San Diego Firehouse? No. No? Well, that, that's one of them. Okay. I'll have to go. Um, thinking about your military experiences, did they influence the way you think about war or the military? And if so, how? Yeah, well, I thought. War is not a very pleasant experience, but the military is, the way they do things to me is comical because it's terrible, terribly wasteful. Just from my own experiences going through mm -hmm. the service, I thought it was terribly wasteful. Can you give me an example? Well, uh, I, like I said, we both, he and I came out of Fort Bragg is gunner corporals on a 105 howitzer. Mm -hmm. So that means you don't ever see a 105 howitzer again. That's the, that's the way they work. Okay. And then, but I, I know I think the ASTP program had to be the biggest waste that any they could imagine. Because, hmm. like I said, the government took over universities throughout the country, all over, the, spread out throughout the country. I don't know, Ohio, California, never, a lot of other places. And we, he and I got through the first semester fine, Half, halfway through the second semester, everything was going good, we were going to be engineers pretty soon, and they closed the whole program down. Now, if that isn't a waste of money, I wonder, do you think it costs anything to take over these universities and hire the professors? <laughs> um. Do you th how do you think the service affected your personal life? I don't know. I guess the biggest thing was it made me thirsty and I needed a lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> what makes you say that? I, that's just the way it was. I don't know. I just uh, we had uh, another guy from town, and I had a sixty-eight day leave right in the starting in June in forty-five, and that's all we did. It okay. Didn't seem like there was anything else needed to do. <laughs> and what type of beer do you like? Well, uh, Budweiser. <laughs> okay. American beer. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, is there anything that we really haven't touched on that you would like to mention or talk about? Uh, anything in here or... I think we pretty much covered it. You have a lot of different things. Tell us about getting your Brown Star. How did it happen? Well... Like my wife said, the, the lieutenant colonel's widow out in Arizona communicated with us and told us that that, 
that I was eligible. And uh, if, if it weren't, it wasn't for her, I wouldn't even have known that. No way to know that. And uh, so I guess Pat called Murphy, right? My daughter called Representative Murphy, and that was it. They set it up from there. It was, that's all you needed to do was give him a call, I guess, and took care of it. And the ceremony? Tell me about the ceremony, the day that you got it. Well, she invited about 15 or 16 people, and when we got there, there was over 100. I don't know how they got there, but we... Everybody had a beer, and pretty soon Mr. Murphy came. And okay. he pinned the, the medal on, and our son gave a nice brief talk. And that was that. And everybody was just hanging around with the. Tell me about the ones on the side and what's on the back of your medal. Can't show it to you? This? Yep. This is my. My name is, is on there. I was amazed because I had three days before I knew that. And the pins that they also gave you that day? Yeah. The, the 60th anniversary of, of VE and VJ Day. Okay. That's that. I don't know what that one is. This is good conduct and that's the Purple Heart. I got another one of them because I have two purple hearts. And uh, this this is probably as prestigious as any of them, the, mm -hmm. the combat infantry badge. How did you, um, if you were in the 105 er, trained to do howitzers, how did you get the CID? How did I get what? This? Mm -hmm. Well, how did they train you for that? Well, when we left Fort Bragg, to go to North Carolina State University, that was the end. I, never, I had never anything more to do with artillery or howitzer. Mm -hmm. That was. They had us trained to be. A, they were both trained to be gunner corporals on one of five howitzer, but we never saw one again. Mm -hmm. And small arms training was done during boot camp. Mostly in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Okay. You see, because. That was that was my first to do with the imagery. Okay. And eight, go ahead. We had eight weeks of advanced training there. Along then, like I said, we had a seven-day furlough, and then you're on the ship. Hmm. Um. Other thoughts that you have? Something that happened that was unique that you'd like to share with the world? Have you been to any reunions? Yes, I went to a division reunion in, uh, what's the name of town, West Virginia? Morgantown. Morgantown, West Virginia. What was it a reunion of? The 106th Division. Okay. Did you see anybody there that you knew? Yes, this stuffy fellow that I talked to, he was there. But. He had changed so that I didn't recognize him. We stood around for a long time looking around to see if we could find him. Finally, I went and asked him if, if that's who he was, and, hmm. and it was. He, it seems to me that he had shrunk in every direction so much that I didn't recognize him. Okay. Um, but he's, he passed away shortly after that. Hmm. Any other reunions? No. No, that's the only that's the only one I went to. They're usually a long ways away. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so anybody that you've ever run into who was in the POW camp with you? I never have, no. And can you spell the name of the town where you think the camp was? Yeah, Lukenwald, L U C K. E N W A L D E. And you you think it was closer to Berlin? 
Yes. Okay. I was. I have never found it on the map, but I. It's there. Huh? Yeah. Never found it on the map. Nope. Okay. Yeah. So it was just the camp. It wasn't a town. Right. All right. It, it was pretty country. Hmm. The big barn where we were in. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. a town or anything it was close to other than Berlin? No. Uh, everything shook most every night because they. It, this is late in the war and they were bombing Berlin every night continuously. Mm. And so we could hear and know that that was going on. At one time towards the end of the war, many of the POWs were marched by the Germans on what was called a death march. Yes. Do you, were you involved in that, or do you remember no. anybody talking about that? Oh, yes. I, I have read about it and knew about it, and uh, but we, we didn't. Uh, the only thing we did is, it was a few miles we walked to this wound store where we, where we were working. But that was not anything to worry about. It was just a short trip. How would you spell Wunsdorf? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, it's W U N S D O R F, and they put them two uh, over the U. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Probably is, but I can't think of it. <laughs> Have you ever been to the military museum in Danbury? Yes. Oh, some of this stuff is over there. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's it then. Um, I, unless I, you have something else you'd like to add. No, I'll think of it in about an hour from now. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> Can you tell me, tell me about the bed bugs and the lice? Well, we didn't sleep any, very much, but of course, when we did, we were so tired that we slept through the bed bugs biting us and making them, and they actually made big sores all over our legs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what she was referring to when she said mm -hmm. first when we went swimming. Did you ever see the bed bugs? No. No. I don't remember seeing them. Do you remember seeing lice? No. But they were there. Okay. They were, the whole, there was no sanitary doings at all around there, of course. There. For, so for six months you never took your uniforms off? and. No. Or shoes either. You couldn't. Okay. It was too cold. There was no heat in these buildings. What about the Russians? We didn't finish the Russian story? No, not about the, not about the young lady there. Oh. Well, we were talking to the Russians as when they liberated us. Uh, a young lady, I suppose middle 20s or so, came by with a little kid. And they're telling us, saying to us, do you want her? Mm. You know. Mm -hmm. And at that point, that was not the thing on our mind. So we shook our heads no. So one of the Russians just took his, not exactly a bird, but an automatic, mm -hmm. and mowed him down. I guess if we didn't want him, they're no good, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, I guess that's what the Germans did to them, so tit for tat or whatever. Did they throw them in a, a grave then or just leave them? Oh, just left them, that's. Okay. During, during the war, Nobody bothered with bodies because they were just there, you know. Mm. How many were mowed down that day, do you remember? Well, that was the only two I actually saw. Okay. But I'm, I'm sure a lot more of them got it. Mm. We, uh, we, at that point, were not interested in what was going on. We just wanted to get the hell out of there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this was right at the end? This what? This was right at the end? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay when the Russians had taken over the camp. Yeah. And these were Russian women and children? 
or Russian woman and child? No, this was German. Oh, a German, German woman girl. and child. Oh, I don't think the Russians would have shot a Russian one. Okay. But uh, I guess they figured the Germans shot all their women and kids, so we'll shoot theirs. Mm. But our only object was to get the hell out of there. <laughs> yep. Any other things you can think of? Not now, I guess. Okay. That isn't a big thing.